sure every single one of us, every single one of us have said this line as it relates to describing a relationship in our life. You've probably said this, but if not, you've probably heard this. Here's the line. We used to be close. We used to be close. In seventh grade, I had this friend, you know, and we hung out all the time. And then in eighth grade, no more. We used to be close. Or maybe there was a season, you know, that you were somewhere or doing something and there was just a person, you and that person had a connection, a friendship, a relationship, whatever. It used to be close, right? Or at the beginning, when we started this relationship or, or when, you know, this new thing came together, the way you would describe the beginning of that relationship with that person, a friend, whoever, it used to be close, but now... Now it's distant. We can all maybe think of a time where a relationship with someone, maybe it was just for a season, or maybe it was someone really important in our lives, it used to be close, and now it's not close. And so we sort of wonder as you start thinking about that, maybe you had a friend or, or whoever, how did things get distant? Like, how did all of a sudden what was close become distant, and likely, likely it fits into two different categories. The distance was created intentionally because you wanted the distance or they wanted the distance. And so intentionally, you know, there, there was, you know, an intentional motive to not hang out anymore, to not call anymore, to not text anymore, to not, you know, hang out at that place anymore. Or maybe, maybe you needed the distance, because to, to stay in proximity of that relationship was bad for you. Maybe not bad in that you were getting hurt, but it was influencing you poorly. Or maybe you were getting hurt and you just needed to get some distance between that person because something reckless happened. And you just, we, we've got to have some space. We've got to have some distance. So maybe distance was created in a relationship intentionally. A another way that distance is created is unintentionally. It's not like you wanted there to be distance. You just moved because you had a new job opportunity or your parents moved you. And so whoever your best friend was in middle school could not be your best friend as you were moving into high school because you moved. Or maybe you started a new job. And so the people you hung out with at that old job are no longer the people you see every day at the new job. You didn't, it's not like you wanted to not connect with those people anymore. You just unintentionally are now in a new place. Or, or maybe just over time, you and a friend or whoever, you just slowly were not interested in the same things anymore. And so the relationship drifted by nobody's choice. It just sort of happened. So how did things get distant? Well, they either got distant intentionally, somebody chose that, or unintentionally, it just sort of drifted away. We've all said, we used to be close. And we all can recognize, now there is distance. Now there is distance. I remember when my relationship with God was distant. Probably the most distant you could ever imagine. It was distant and it was non-existent. Now, I grew up going to church uh, pretty regularly. My parents took me. And then at some point, you know, in seventh or eighth grade, I, I, I intentionally decided I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to have this relationship. This isn't for me. Church isn't for me. Faith isn't for me. And it took about six years, maybe a little more, to begin to feel the effect of that distance. It took a while for, for me to begin to experience uh, what that distance was creating in my life. And so in that place, I decided, I decided that I needed to seek this relationship with God again. And in the process of sort of piecing back together my relationship with God over the next several months... At one point, I came across a Bible. It was like an old Bible, and I had opened it. And, you know, this was, you know, we have these Bibles that just sit around our house, right? And so here's one that I had. And inside of it was written to the memorization champ of VBS, you know? And I was maybe in like fourth grade or something. And in that moment, as I read that, as I'm, you know, trying to piece back together my relationship with God, I had this thought, and I, and I think about this still. I ha so somewhere along the way, I got distant. 
I used to be close. Or I used to, you know, it used to be important to me. I used to be good at it, I guess, you know. And then somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, my relationship with God became distant. Maybe you have a used to story with your Heavenly Father. I used to go to church often. Every time they would open up the doors, I was there because I was hungry to further my relationship with God. Maybe you have a used to story. I used to pray. I used to pray every day because I just needed it, and I, and I knew I, I didn't have control over my circumstances, and I, and I needed my heavenly Father's comfort and wisdom and strength, and I knew I would get it when I prayed. I used to make my relationship with God a priority, but then other things have become a priority. You know, I, I used to have a relationship with God that was strong and vibrant when I was in high school, and then I went to college, and something changed. You know, I used to have a strong relationship with God until we started having kids. And then I just lost track of time and we became overwhelmed and I became busy and we had to, you know, start planning everything and, and we slowly and I slowly and I used to. I used to have a stronger relationship with God before these struggles came up. And it's caused a little bit of distance. I used to have a better relationship with God before the divorce. And then afterwards, I, I mean, I'm just picking up the pieces, trying to sort all this out. What about this one? Before COVID, I used to have a regular, consistent connection with the local church that helped foster my faith and strengthen me. But since then, it's less. We used to be close. Now, there's distance. We used to be close. What led to that? And if you wanted to, how do you get close again? How do you, how do you piece back together? How do you close the gap of the distance between you and God? And so over the next four weeks, starting today, we're going to be talking about one thing each week that creates distance between us and our Heavenly Father. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll talk about something that can help, help reignite, reimagine, close the distance between us and our Heavenly Father. So maybe today, maybe today you feel at a distance from God. And you're wondering, it's not like you haven't tried you're wondering, how do, I, how do I get close again? How do I not just get close again, but how do I feel close again? Maybe today, maybe today you feel distant. And so Jesus tells three stories in Luke chapter 15. Three stories. We're going to talk about one of those stories today, but, but you have to know that Jesus tells these stories because He's responding to the muttering of the Pharisees and the religious elite of Jerusalem and of Judea. And they are, they're sort of picking on Jesus' his, his closeness to a group of people, which, you know, we can put in quotations, and which is what Luke writes in Luke 15, 1. He was eating with, you know, tax collectors, which are the worst, and they cheat everybody, and they're traitors to our cause, and the sinners, which in their minds, they probably would have likely said unclean people, people who have done something to make them unclean. And if you were a first century Jew, you just don't, you know, you don't associate with, you keep your distance from people who are unclean or doing unclean type things because maintaining your cleanliness, well, that's how you stay close to God. And so they're muttering that Jesus is having a meal with people who ought to be in their minds, at a distance. And the third story, in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, is pretty dynamic. We're going to get to part one of the story today. And here's how it goes in Luke 15, chapter 11. There was a man who had two sons. 
The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a, now I need everybody to say this next word with me. He set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Now, Jesus introduced the characters of this story, and we meet the father. The father we can grasp here is probably wealthy because he has something to divide, and life at the father's, you know, estate would probably be described as pretty good because if he has land to divide and all of these riches and all this kind of thing, it's probably a pretty good livelihood. And what's interesting, too, is we see early on that the father has this strange willingness to meet his son's demand, which sort of begins to point to us his character. He probably wasn't, you know, a super hard person to be around if he's willing to here and right now divide and, and, you know, sort of give his son what he's asking for. And then we also meet the younger son. Now, the older son we'll meet next week, but the younger son, the younger son goes to his father. We're not sure how old he is, but he has a desire He wants his wealth now. He wants his inheritance now. He wants to pursue his own thing, his own vision, his own life, his own livelihood. And somewhere in there, he makes a decision to go to his father, who by all accounts, things look good, and he has a future set up for him. And he basically, basically is asking, hey, let's pretend, let's pretend that you're dead And let's speed up that process and give me what I'm due so I can get on with what I want to do. And that's sort of where the younger son is. So what's happening here? He made a decision. What's beginning to happen here? Distance is created by this decision, by a decision. The moment the younger son makes this decision to separate from his, heaven, from his father, distance begins to be created. The text tells us that not long after this decision and not long after the father divides you know, his share of the inheritance, he heads out. It doesn't take long for him to create more distance and more distance and more distance. You see, distance, all distance in relationships, distance in the relationship with your heavenly father It's created by decisions, my decisions, and your decisions. And distance is continued by a sequence of more decisions. So somewhere along the way, distance might be between you and your Heavenly Father because you made a decision, and you kept making decisions that took you away or at least in a different direction than your heavenly father. And so we see the son, he goes off to a distant country, and he squanders his inheritance, right? He, and the word squandering, literally, you know, the image that comes to mind is scattering, like literally throwing up in the air and seeing how far it can go is the idea being carried here, the idea of waste, And we can imagine what he spent it on, right? To a distant country, on spending on his pleasures and desires and and so forth. And and the Bible describes him as uh, he he was having wild living, which is where we get our English word prodigal. And this is the only place that it's used in the Bible, which means reckless. He was reckless with his decisions. He was reckless with his inheritance and what he had, and that was who he was, and that was the kind of decisions he made. He was reckless with what his father had given him, and he was reckless with their relationship, and therefore there was distance. What decisions, what decisions have you made that have created, contributed to distance? You were once close, closer to your heavenly father. 
but a decisions have been made. And now you're distant. So Jesus is telling the story because he wants us to see right away that the younger son has trouble making decisions. He's actually quite reckless, and we can see that very clearly. And the way he treated his father is just absolutely unbelievable in that culture, which was built on family. And for him to, you know, gather the wealth, he would have to sell family land that has been in the family and for, for generations. And it would have just been so shameful. Just so, like, we can't even imagine the degree of shame that this would have brought on his family. And so he made a terrible decision. And then he kept making decisions. Have you ever wondered why people make and keep making poor decisions? Have you ever wondered that? And the reason why is because there is a delay. We stay because there is a delay in the consequences of those decisions. People keep making poor decisions because they don't experience consequences. And so, because nothing happened on the other side of this decision, in fact, I'm actually experiencing fun or joy or, or you know, some sort of effect that I was intending for because there's no bad consequences, because things are good, I'm going to keep making these decisions because it seems to be the right way to go. I'm so glad I asked my father for my inheritance and, you know, I'm the king of my own ship now and I can do whatever I want and come in whenever I want and spend my money however I want on whoever I want. I can do whatever I want. And, and early returns for the younger son was good. And so in his mind, hey, no consequences. I'm having a good time. I'm going to keep making these. And he wouldn't have said it like this, bad decisions. Verse 14, after he had spent everything. He didn't plan for this next part. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now listen to this. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one, no one gave him anything. We get this one picture of the son living it up. And in this picture, it's kind of brutal reality. He, he spent everything, which carries the idea that he just couldn't keep up with. He ran out. We don't know how long this span lasted where he was on empty, where he was alone, where he was desperate. But in his distance and in his sequence of bad decisions, two things happened. The first thing that happened was there was a famine. Now, this was an external famine, and it was in that country, not in his home country. It was in that country. So the, the location he chose put him in a position to experience external famine and difficulty. And so, so because of his distance, he was experiencing more and more problems. And then that resulted in what we can see here is an internal famine of his soul. What does this look like? I'm empty. I'm hungry. And I'm alone. Now, how many of you know, how many of you know that when you're living at a distance from God, here is where it leads to personal, spiritual, emotional, and mental famine. Now, if you're living at a distance from God, you may not be experiencing that right now, but I'm telling you, in that country, an external famine will happen, and you will find yourself depleted. I'm praying, I'm praying that, that someone here today who's living at a distance will, will do what I'm about to read. Well, this will happen to you. This is my hope. This is my prayer. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Something happened in him at this miserable place. 
He, he's, he came to. His mind, his heart, his soul woke up to his situation. He could see. And this took time. We don't know how long. But it takes time to sort of recognize where your distance has taken you and what condition your soul is really in. And so, so here's sort of what the son is saying. I have made bad decisions. I made bad decisions. And my decisions have led me here, alone and starving. And I'm at a distance from my father. Think about this. If he knew, if the son, when he's, you know, asking for his inheritance and planning his journey, if he knew that that decision would ultimately lead to being in a place where what he was desiring was pig food and having to decide whether or not he wanted to eat that food to survive, I don't think he makes the first decision. I don't think he sees where his sequence of decisions are going to take him. I think if he knew that that's where he was going to be desiring something very, very strange, I don't think he makes the decisions he makes to get him there. Every decision that you and I make is either creating closeness to God or distance from God. And we don't always see it like that, but it's absolutely true. Something happens to the younger son as he's desiring the pig pods in this pig pen and this awful place that his decisions created. What happens to him? Humility. Humility. He feels it. He doesn't just know he made bad decisions, knows he makes he made poor decisions. He, he sees it and he feels it and he's ashamed. That's humility. He is humiliated. And it's his fault. And he knows it. I made the poor decisions. I created this distance. Now, we can all learn something here. You don't have to experience humiliating consequences to learn how to make good decisions. You don't. You don't have to. You and I, you can decide humility ahead of time. You can do that. And I just want to give you three quick tips before we move on to the rest of the message on how to, how to avoid uh, feeling this kind of humiliation and to decide uh, to have a humble decision-making process so you can avoid bad decisions. Here's the first one. You need to, as you're trying to make decisions about what to do with your life and where you're going and what you're going to do this week, you need to find antidotes for hazardous, decision, hazardous attitudes. You need to find antidotes for hazardous attitudes. Now, in the Aeronautical Decision-Making Handbook by the FAA, uh, they take safety into a high level for pilots, and they've identified five hazardous attitudes that can cause some major problems as you're trying to pilot a plane. Here are those attitudes. An anti-authority attitude. Don't tell me. Or impulsivity. Do it quickly. These are the kinds of attitudes that cause problems and safety issues when flying an aircraft. This kind of attitude. Invulnerability. It won't happen to me. A macho attitude. I can do it. Strong enough. I'll make it. Or resignation. What's the use? Each of these attitudes are different. But if that's the attitude that you and I carry around with our regular decision making, much less trying to fly and navigate an aircraft, the, the wreckage could be the same in our own life. There are some antidotes given to these pilots as they learn safe flying. For the first one, instead of having an anti-authority attitude, you could follow the rules because they're usually right. That's why they're there. Instead of having a do-it-quickly attitude, you could, you could not decide so fast or do things so fast. You could think first. I mean, we saw this in, in the prodigal son, right? It didn't take him any time to leave. Think first. This invulnerability mindset, it could happen to you. 
you could become an alcoholic. You could become addicted to that. You might not be able to stop. This macho attitude, we need to understand that taking chances is foolish. And whenever we're making decisions, whenever we're making decisions, we're taking chances. We're either creating distance or we're getting closer to God. And finally, this resignation attitude, which is sort of a self-defeated attitude, you're not helpless. Even when you're at the bottom of, you know, the pig pit of poor decisions, you can make a difference. You're not helpless. And so what do we need to do? We need to decide humility ahead of time instead of letting our decisions take us to a place of humiliation that we don't want to be. We need to find antidotes for these hazardous attitudes. The second thing to build humility ahead of time is to gather outside perspective. Gather outside perspective. You know what we do? Whenever we make a decision, there's this idea in behavioral science called anchoring. And what this is, is after you or I make a logical or illogical decision, we have a tendency as human beings to cling to it and filter out any dissenting information, and then we immediately begin to look for data that supports our decision and confirms our decision-making. That's what anchoring is. And it's very dangerous if the decisions you've made are illogical or bad or have created distance between you and your Heavenly Father. See, it's reckless. It's reckless to make decisions alone. We need outside perspective. We need other people's views. Those who, who make decisions and are left with regret often don't make decisions with the right input and the right feedback from the right people. So you need to find perspectives that you're listening to as you're making decisions, important decisions, even small decisions. And it matters who you're listening to. You don't just listen to whoever. Is the person you're listening to, are they living the kind of life you want? Do they have the kind of marriage you want? Are they successful like you want? Are they a follower of Jesus that you're trying to be? Like you don't just listen to anyone. You listen to people that are where you want to be and have appropriate experience. The third thing you can do to have humility ahead of time is you can play it forward. If I could teach every young person in this room this principle, this would make such a difference in your life. Every decision you make leads to another decision. And so what do you need to do? You need to play it forward. You need to say, if I make this decision, what will be the next decision because of this decision? If I make this decision, will this put me in a position that I want to be in? If I make this decision, will this help me be who I want to be? Will this take me where I want to go? If I make this decision, who could be hurt by this decision? We need to learn to play our decisions forward. You might be thinking, I wasn't wise. I created distance. I have created distance with God. How do I get close again? I'm humbled. I know I am the one who made bad decisions. So how do I turn this around? Listen to how the younger son thinks in his new humility. In verse 18, he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's humility. Make me like one of your hired servants. Humility gives this young man an accurate view of his self and the situation that he's in. And then his humility produces something else, clarity. Clarity. I can now see what I need to do to get close again. Let me at least try to get as close as I can. I may not be able to be a son again, but I, I see that I left something good and, and I wanted, maybe I could just be a servant. That's so much better than this. Now, this young man has two things that are needed to make good decisions. He has humility and he has clarity. So what does he do? He gets up and went, he got, so he got up and went to his father. That's the first good decision that he has made in a long time. 
He looks at his situation with humility and clarity, and he says, I am rising up out of this, and I'm heading back to my father because I don't want there to be distance, and I certainly don't want to stay here. What do we need to do to get close to our heavenly father again? The same thing that created distance you need to do to get close again. What do you need to do? You need to make one decision. One decision. You see, one decision at a time removes distance. One decision, one step, one thing to take you closer to your heavenly father, that's how you remove distance. Imagine the sun heading back from a distant country. Each step is a decision. Each step forward is a decision closer to his father. The whole while, he's absolutely second-guessing himself. He's probably filled with doubt, and he's not sure how his father is going to respond when he finally gets there, but he has decided he's going to get close again, one decision at a time. Now, just like his reckless decisions didn't have immediate consequences, and this is, this is important, your good decisions, they don't have immediate positive consequences. What do I mean by that? You may start to take steps towards your heavenly father, but you're not going to feel the reward right away. And so you're going to be tempted to get discouraged. You don't want to do that. Because one decision at a time, over time, removes distance. You got to stay consistent. One decision at a time, over time, removes distance. Now, there was a neurologist named George York and Dr. Robert Pearl, who's a professor at Stanford Grad School, and they named this idea that I'm about to share with you, brain shift. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to explain why is it that good and smart people make bad decisions? I mean, publicly bad decisions. And so they did some research, and they determined that we make decisions based upon two primary places of decision-making. The first one is whatever we fear greatly really influences our decisions. The second one is what we want badly influences our decisions. So wherever there is high anxiety or high reward, we tend to decide those things. What's interesting about the son the younger son, as he heads home, look at this, his fear and his wants, they're now aligned and they're focused on the father. Who does he fear? The father. Who does he want to be close to? The father. There's an interesting alignment that's taking place in his soul. He's not sure what to expect. He doesn't know what the father's going to do. But in verse 20, this is so amazing. While he was still a long way off, the fa his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Don't miss this. When there was still lots of distance between the father and the son, this is what the father does. There's something that moves inward in the father. That's called compassion. Compassion so that it resulted in an outward expression. And by the way, what the father does here is very, very reckless. Dignified men in that culture don't run anywhere. And here he is heading off after the son who shamed the entire family. And I love what N.T. Wright suggests. He, he suggests that this parable, which is called the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son, it should probably be called the parable of the running father. Because that's what this is about. And I just want to show you a picture. Rembrandt, a famous artist in the 1600s, tried to depict this in an oil painting of what this would look like. You can actually see, you know, the son coming back, missing his shoe. You can see that his life has, has really beat him up. And, and he is just on his knees. And the father has his hands around him. The father has a robe on, which signifies... Uh, you know, that he has wealth and all these kinds of things. And, and just watch, look at him. 
receiving his son. Now, if you look even more closely, Rembrandt had painted the hands of the father differently. The left hand of the father is more bold and masculine and tough, I guess. And the right hand of the father, when we zoom up on it on our next slide, the right hand of the father is more soft, maybe more feminine. And this is incredibly intentional because this is the God that we come back to, a God that is strong and powerful, but a God that is tender and compassionate and forgiving. And so what do we need? We need to understand that when we want to come back to the Father, it's not the Father we expect, the Father that's going to shame us, the Father that's going to you know, overwhelm us with judgment. This is the Father that we come back to. Even if we're the, at fault for everything, to get close to God again, you need humility, you need clarity, and you need an accurate picture of your heavenly Father. See, every step you and I take to the Father, He takes a thousand steps. Every step we walk, He runs. Why? Because He loves you, and He wants you, and He wants this relationship with you. Every moment you've been gone, he's been longing and wanting the connection to come back, not so that he could have something, but because he knows where you went isn't providing the kind of life that he could provide for you. Just as reckless, God is just as reckless with giving grace to every terrible decision you've ever made as you were in your poor choices. In fact, probably more so. And some of you, some of us, we're not coming close because this isn't our view of the Father. But I want to assure you, the Father is full of compassion and tenderness and grace. See, the Son tries to give his speech, you know, in humility, but the Father interrupts him. Like he barely lets him finish. In verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He didn't even get a finish. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and now he is found. Just as quick as the son rushed off to a distant country, the father reinstates the son in the family. He covers his shame. He wastes no time in forgiving him and welcoming him home. That's who your father in heaven is. The son was distant, and now he's close again. And you can get close again, too. How do we get close how do we get close again? One decision at a time. One step at a time over time. One decision at a time over time. See, transformation, and you know this, transformation happens a decision at a time. How do great marriages happen? One decision at a time over time. How do you overcome anger? One decision at a time over time. How do you forgive others? One decision at a time, over time. How do you get healthy spiritually or physically? One decision at a time, over time. How do you have a close personal relationship with your heavenly father? One decision at a time, over time. You might think, I'm still a long way off. I'm so far from perfect, from who I need to be, I can never change. I can never become the son that my father intended me to be. But that's not true. Why? Because what do you have? You have humility. You have clarity. And you have a new picture of your heavenly father. And what are you going to do? You are going to, over time, one decision at a time, get close to God again. Do you want to get close to God again? If so, what's your one decision today? What's your one decision? 
You're not going to get close to God unless you make a decision today. It's that simple. What is your one decision to get closer to God today? Maybe you're going to say, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to read it every day because this relationship with God means something to me. Maybe you're going to decide, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray when I get up in the morning for 10 minutes because I know that's how I've got to go back to the Father. Maybe you think, my family needs to follow God better. What are we going to do? We're going to go to church every week. We're not going to skip because every time we skip, we're risking our children's foundation and the faith. What are we going to do? We're going to pray before dinner. Our family's busy, but for 30 seconds, we're going to remind everyone that everything we have is from him and we need to follow him. What's your one decision? Maybe your one decision is I'm going to give. And I'm going to give to the local church. Because what creates distance between me and God is I like to be the Lord of my treasures. And it's really hard for me to do that. Money will always create distance between you and God. You can't serve them both. I don't know what you need to do. Maybe you need to say, hey, I need to join a life group because I need others. I'm doing faith alone. I've been putting this off. I'm way too busy. What are you busy doing? Creating distance. Get engaged. Maybe, maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure what to do. Let me suggest to you, serve. There's something that happens in you when you serve people. Maybe you need to serve here. Maybe you need to serve in the community. Maybe you need to delete that app. Maybe you need to put your phone down for the first hour of the day. Maybe you just need to say, I need help. I need help with this addiction. I need help with this problem. I need help in this pit of depression. You just need to tell somebody. Maybe you're here today, you're following Jesus, but it's not a public faith. You've never gotten in front of people and said, this is my story. I want to be baptized. I'm trying to get close again. I need all of my sins washed. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you were baptized as an infant. That wasn't your decision. You need to make that decision. So I don't know what your one decision is today. But here's what I know. How do you get close to God again? One decision at a time over time. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you this morning. Some of us, we've been reckless. We made decision after decision that has created distance, and now we want to come back and just remind us how compassionate you are and how you can do a new work in us. Some of us, our distance is more of a drift. We've sort of drifted from you, and now we're feeling those effects, and God, just know this. We see you running to us. We're so sorry for getting off path. Would you, would you bring us back? Rekindle what we once had. Would you make this relationship close again like it used to be? Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you stand to your feet?